Uh, if we have Maya, my name is Mark, and I uh, just want to add my welcome to the many welcomes you probably already got this week, and uh, uh, thanks to our host. And next week, I get to host. I'm super stoked about it, because if you've been here for you know, more than a year, you know, just over a year ago, we had this thing called Affirmation Sunday, where uh, the partners of this church, sometimes when there's a, a big hire going on, there's actually, the, the elders actually ask the partners to affirm that. It's like, they, they lead us and guide us, but there's something valuable about, as a community, us affirming things. And uh, so I, I preached like 800 of you, and then it was like a... It was like a giant Tinder date where you just like, at the end, meeting me one time, you just decided if I was going to be your pastor or not. Uh, and so that was super overwhelming. But this time, I get to host that event, and you're not voting on me. Uh, if you're a partner, you've already checked your mailbox, or maybe you haven't yet this month, check your mailbox, uh, because you got info uh, weeks ago about a uh, big vote that's happening where our senior interim senior leader, Jeff Grunewald, the elders have unanimously decided and so excited that he's going to uh, move forward to be presented as our senior uh, executive leader. And so we're so so pumped about that. And if you don't know Jeff, Je yeah, how exciting is that? Uh, if you don't know Jeff, a lot of people come to me they're like, yeah, yeah, so you're like the leader. I'm like, no, no, I'm, I'm not in charge. I go home and kiss my kids and eat dinner while, you know, someone else stresses about all the things going on here and makes everything go. But Jeff, who's leading worship today, is actually our senior leader and now is going to be uh, affirmed next week as our, uh, as our uh, executive pastor. And so we're so excited about that. And I'm just so excited that you're not voting on me. You know, I'm, I'm just excited to kind of host that, tell you, check your ballots. We're going to, it's going to be awesome. Uh, so you don't want to miss that next week. We're so, so excited. And uh, as Trevina said, Monday 5 is a great uh, resource. If you're not checking that and you're like, I feel out of the loop, it's like, because you are. There's the Monday five, and you're over here, okay? So uh, check that out, and you'll always be up to speed. You can just put on your connection card your email address and check for email and the weekly newsletter, and you will start getting that, and you'll be totally up to speed on what's happening. Um, but uh, we are in part four of a series, and I have to tell you, something really fun happened this week. I shared a story last week about one of my personal areas of anxiety, and I shared the story of getting two letters, an email, and a letter. And I think you guys thought I was talking about, like, lakeside people. Because every email I got this week had in the subject line, this one's safe to open, which I so appreciated. I so, so appreciated. But it wasn't like some people. You guys are awesome. You send me such nice emails. So keep sending your nice emails. It's like one of those like, aww, right? But you guys are awesome. It wasn't about you at all. Um, but I, I loved getting those subject lines. They were hilarious. And uh, love you guys. So anyways, we are part four of a series. Part four is kind of where we cross the threshold where I feel like if I try and summarize every week, the end of the summary will be, okay, see you next week, right? Like, it's too long. So we're not gonna do a full summary, but if you're here for the first time today, you're in from the long weekend, we're gonna make it stand on its own. We try to do that every time with every part of a series, but also if it piques your interest or you feel like you missed a part, everything's on our website. You can watch it on YouTube. You can listen to it on our podcast. You can get caught up, but the main part of the summary of the series is that we're talking about being gifted, and here's what we believe as Christians, that through the Holy Spirit, every one of us is given gifts that when we allow allow the Spirit to use us, we don't look better, even though, you know, usually when someone's gifted and talented, they look good when they do something good, but God looks good. That when the church gets things right, we live the Jesus way, we live in response to the Spirit, and the world takes notice in the same way that they took notice of Jesus. Because as we like to say around here, people who are nothing like Jesus, like Jesus. But church people often don't have that same reputation. But if we step into this, it is something that would turn the world upside down. And so if you're here and you're on a quest, you're like, and we have a lot of people just kind of like, I'm wrestling, I have questions, I'm not sure, there, maybe there's a God, maybe there isn't. How does it apply to my life? Here's the, here's the thing, you know, if you're like not church person, not Christian, or just not sure what you are, here's the thing to kind of do today is we're kind of talking about, hey, here's what it means to be fully alive and gifted as Christians. You just kind of like lean back a little bit and just be like, what would that be like? Let's say this was true. Would that be good or bad? You just, you just kind of take that approach. Like, I don't have to believe it all, but like, I love imagining things. So you just kind of like, everything we talk about today, you'd be like, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? You just kind of take notes. I think it's awesome. I think you'll agree, but that's kind of what we're talking about today. And you're totally, you know, uh, good to kind of audit this course, so to speak, just kind of watch from the outside. And, and we're glad that you're journeying with us. Um, but as we're starting, actually, I want to tell you, our TV just crashed in the middle of worship. So I'm not going to use the TV today, but we're going to have it up on the screen on the wall. Look at that. Look at that. Working. Um, so anyways, I don't know if you've ever noticed this, but you've ever kind of said to yourself or to someone, or maybe you just thought it, or maybe you actually said it out loud, but it's like, I'm not really a spiritual person. You ever, you ever said that? Maybe you're like, you're religious. You're a Christian even. But you're like, I'm not really spiritual. There's spiritual people, and then there's me, right? There's like those people, and then there's me. I'm like a meat and potatoes. I go to a job site. I work with my hands. I chat with real people. I don't even have, like, like I just, I'm not spiritual. I believe in Jesus, but I'm just, I wouldn't be considered like a spiritual person. 
You know, or maybe you're, you're not religious, and that's the reason why you're just like, because I, I just don't connect with spiritual people. Like, they're just kind of weird. Like, they're just, they're this. The people listening to the podcast have no idea what I'm doing, but like, like you know what I mean? It's just like, that, like, they're the people that, like, when you kind of go over for dinner and like, would you like a, a house tour? I always want a house tour. If you have me at your house, I want a house tour, okay? Give me a house tour. It's awesome. Uh, but anyways, uh, get me a coffee first, though, or whatever you're serving. I'll have that. And then the house tour. But anyways, on the house tour, you're going through the house, and then they're like, and this is the bedroom, and this is the other bedroom, and this is our, and they, they say this, and this is how you know they're spiritual people, and you're like, I don't get you. Like, this is our prayer closet, and you're like, it's empty. You have a closet with nothing in it? Like, what do you, what do you, what, babe, there's a closet, and they don't have, like, we put overflow of our clothes into our kids' closets. You have an empty closet? Like, that's just real estate that's open for you? It's like, oh, no, it's my prayer closet. I just, I just go in there to pray. It's just like, yeah, spiritual people not physical people, right? It's just like, there's just, there's just something about that. It just like doesn't, doesn't land. Or maybe it's like that conversation you have with someone. It's like, what'd you do this weekend? It's like, I went to church. It's like, well, what'd you do the rest of the weekend besides that one hour? Like, no, I was there the whole weekend. It's like, you're part of a cult? Right? It's like, like no, no, I just enjoy it. Like, we had this big event. We had this encounter thing. Like, it's like, okay, spiritual people? And then me, just regular people, just doesn't make sense. They're the people that like in worship, you come to church, maybe you visit, maybe you're a regular and they're the people with their hands up, eyes closed. Like you actually look like you're talking to someone, but like who, right? Like again, spiritual people and then people, people. I, uh, I like this song, uh, like this song, it's a song that came out a few years ago. Remember the song, Take Me to Church? Everyone born after 1984 remembers that song. It came out a few years ago. Uh, and it was, someone actually once came to me like, hey, pastor, this is this great new song I heard on the radio. It's called Take Me to Church. We should sing it at church. And I was like, I have, <laughs> see, some of you know, right? Some of you know, you've read the lyrics. And I was like, you know, it's not about church, right? And they're like, really? What do you mean? And I'm like, let me just, the, the song, here's some of the lyrics. A worship in the bedroom, the only heaven I'll be sent to is when I'm alone with you. So take me to church. And I'm like, Oh, I'm like, so I'm not going not gonna to be doing that one on Sunday, just so you know. But, but the thing I thought was awesome was uh, the, the person who wrote it, Hosier, the guy that performs it and, and wrote the song, fascinating interview with him when he's talking about it. he actually grew up in a religious home. He said, it's not a critique of, of the church, said, but, but it is kind of, 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 of faith, just kind of that idea. And this is, this is what he says when he's talking about why he wrote this song and what he was trying to express. He says, the song, oh, it's working! <laughs> Give it up for our tech crew! <laughs> Jacob! Look at that. They're straight Jedis, these guys. All right. The song is about asserting yourself and reclaiming your humanity, physical, through an act of love. Turning your back on the theoretical thing, something that's not tangible, and choosing to worship or love something that is tangible or real, something that can be experienced that that resonates with so many people because so many people have lived in this world where there is spiritual people and then there is physical people. And he's saying, I'm just like, this, this thing isn't doing it for me. I can't grasp it. I can't get my head around it. Like the spiritual, that's great. I'm not, he actually says, I'm not judging faith, but I actually want to worship something tangible and physical. He's saying there's a dichotomy between the two. But the interesting thing is that when you open up the scriptures and you read the Bible, you never find a divide between spiritual and physical. That God, arguably the most spiritual there ever was and ever will be, opens up in the first chapter of scripture and begins to create the earth. And in the Hebrew, in the original language, it says when he creates, he's not just like floating around. He's like, literally, it's the word that's used in Hebrew for like a landscaper, blue collar worker, lifting up their sleeves and getting in the dirt and crafting and creating. He is totally spiritual and yet very much physical. That he creates human beings. And the thing he says about human beings, he says everything else was good. He, he was amazed at creation. The same way that you stand in awe and wonder at a beautiful mountain, he does as well. He says it's good. And then he creates humans and he says, they're made in my image. You ever notice humans are a little different than creation? Something a little bit better about humans than just creation? And he says, and the humans are actually made in my image, physical and spiritual. It says that he actually walked in the Garden of Eden in the cool of day with his creation. There's no divide between physical and physical and spiritual and the God of the Bible. That there's no dichotomy. You look at Jesus, who is 100% God and 100% human. God in the flesh, God incarnate, I say God in a bod, right? And he just, he's totally physical, he's totally normal. I think so often we think, this is what Jesus must have looked like. And it's like, if you looked like that, 
somehow I feel like there'd be a lot more written about your childhood. We have like, how many verses written about Jesus' child? First 30 years, you know what we know? We know that God in the flesh, God incarnate, God in the bod, got lost and his parents couldn't find him. How many parents, how many uncles, how many grandparents have lost a child in public? I never have, I'm just showing you what to do. Okay. <laughs> Don't you feel so much better about your parenting game right now? It's like, my kid's on a good trajectory. Jesus got lost too. The only thing we know in 30 years of his life was that he was so normal he wasn't even worth writing about. And then all of a sudden, he began his ministry, the spiritual side of things, and yet he was still so, so real that he actually worked. It says he was a carpenter. That he laughs and he cries and he goes to weddings and he goes to funerals. He actually goes to funerals and grieves, even though he knows he's actually going to raise that person from the dead. He's so human. He's so in the moment. There's no divide between his physical self and his spiritual self. He didn't have this like divinity pack that he turned on and off. He was both things all at once. That he went towards the hurting. He even argued with religious people because he found them annoying too. And he made his own wine. And I hear his wine was pretty good. The Bible doesn't divide physical and spiritual. And neither should we. And the reason that's important, because as we talk about spiritual gifts and being gifted by the Spirit or our spiritual superpowers, it is so important that we understand this. Because there's so many people that have been paralyzed by the lie that says, I'm not a spiritual person, so that doesn't really apply to me. There are some people, they have prayer closets. They're the spiritually gifted ones. It's like, no, 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 no. When you became a Jesus person, the Holy Spirit came on you and gifted you in ways that we're going to start unpacking over the next three weeks, and you cannot opt out any longer because you are so physical and so spiritual. You were made for both, and we reject that lie that you have to be one or the other. Because when we become a community that accepts this reality, God begins to become visible to the world around us as we allow the Spirit to work through the different gifts that he's given us. And so if you want to turn in your Bible, we're just going to quickly go over a passage that Daniel taught us about two weeks ago, Acts chapter 6. And just to give you a quick summary of what he taught us, because he spent a lot of time unpacking it today. We're not going to spend as much time. Um, this is in the early, early first century, and so it's like 2,000 years ago. Jesus is, you know, resurrected from the dead. D dead. There's just this Jesus movement that's just growing and growing and growing. And it's not just growing with religious people. It's just people people, as I like to say. And so you got people from different ethnicities, different countries, um, different family backgrounds. You you have people who are wealthy. You have people who are poor. Some of you know this. Some of you know that the cost of accepting Jesus as your Savior has meant you're not part of your family. You're not welcome in your country anymore. So that was going on. And so there's the Jewish Christians and the Greek Christians. And all of a sudden, there's a little bit of drama going on where it's like people are selling stuff to make sure that other people have enough to eat. And someone kind of puts their hands up and they're like, we don't have enough food. Like, these people are getting more food than these people. Can so someone do something? So they go to the leaders of the church. They go to the, the people who are speaking and teaching, and they're like, we need to do something because some people are going hungry while other people are eating. And uh, Daniel kind of brought us to that tension in the story where the people who are doing the teaching kind of say, like, we can't stop preaching, so let's find some people who can do the cooking. And it's one of those verses that he kind of drew out this drama, but like, it always bothered me, especially as a preacher, because it was almost like, a, no, we're too busy preaching, so we need some warm bodies that can, you know, who aren't doing anything else, who are good for nothing, you know, maybe they're not working, they have some time, and they can do the food, you know, probably some women, you know, it's just like there's all these stereotypes going on, and yet, when you actually look at the scripture, you discover something totally different, and it's actually really helpful. Whenever you discover something about God, or something in scripture that you balk at, that you're like, ugh, don't run away from it, move closer. Because when you move closer, you start to discover every time, I guarantee it, there's something else going on. You may be reading your cultural lens into it, but this is what we discover. Brothers and sisters, choose seven men from among you who are known to be full of the spirit and wisdom. We will turn this responsibility over to them. It didn't say, we're too busy preaching, and we can't stop. They actually, you know, in the bigger part of the verse, it's like, we don't feel the freedom that we feel God has called us to do this, so we can't stop. But we're looking for people. We're not looking for a specific gender of people that is normally put in this category. In fact, we're actually looking for men in this category. And it's like, and, and we don't even know if they can cook or not, but we're looking for people who are filled with the Spirit. And those are the people that we are going to entrust with this task of making sure that everybody's eating, everything's fair, they had no idea even what their spiritual gifts were. And then the long story short, this is the bottom line of the verse. Verse 7 says, so the word of God spread. The message of Jesus spread. It just continued to grow. The number of disciples in Jerusalem increased rapidly, and a large number of priests became obedient 
to the faith. I have no idea how. I don't know if any of those people even knew how to cook. I have no idea. But people who had the power of the Spirit in them said yes, and something happened, and the world began to change. Here's how I'd summarize what Daniel taught us a few weeks ago. The presence, power, and love of God is spread when we all do what the Spirit is empowering us to do. The presence, power, and love of God is spread when we all do what the Spirit is empowering us to do. That's really long. Let me make it really short for you. You ready for this? God moves when we do. God moves when we do. They were willing. They were willing. They were willing, and God moved. Some of you are like, whoa, 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 that's bad theology. God doesn't need us for him to move. He doesn't work like that. It's not like he's, it's like, no, you're right. God can do whatever he wants. But like a good parent who chooses to allow their child to help them make coffee, to work in the garden, to mow their lawn, it's gonna take 10 times as long, but it is the loving thing to do. It is the parent thing to do. God is a good father, and he can do it all himself, but he invites us into the process of making himself known. God moves when we do. God moves when we do. I think so often when we're talking about spiritual gifts, and and this is not against spiritual gifts test. We actually have one on our website. If you want to do it, please, I encourage that. But so often there's been this lie that says, there's a formula that you need to crack, and until you know what your spiritual gifts are and you see them working and all that stuff, then you can't actually serve and you can't actually use them. We have no evidence of that in the scriptures. We see people who say, no, I'm part of the body. We're one in many. We're in this together. There's a need. I'm jumping in. I'm just going to do my part. I'm not even sure if this is my gift, but I'm in. That's what we see in the narrative. That's what we see. And so this lie that says that you have to have it figured out. You have to know if you have a spiritual gift. You have to agree that you're a spiritual person. It's like, if you're a Jesus person, this is part of your identity. Step into it, and we'll figure out the rest as we go. So today, what I want to do is I want to start unpacking, and we're going to take three weeks to do this, some of the, what was probably about 19 spiritual gifts that we find in Scripture, okay? Not talent. People ask me, like, what's the difference between people's talent and their spiritual gifts? Sometimes they're tied, but talent is something that you can innately do even before you become a Jesus person. It's just something you're really good at, okay? Your spiritual gift may tie into that, and it may not at all, but here's how you know the difference between talent and gift. Talent, people look at you and say, wow, you're incredible. A spiritual gift helps people see God through your gift. It helps people encounter him, okay? So that's one of the big differences. Uh, like I said, there's, there's 19 of them, so we're going to break it up into three weeks because it's a lot to unpack. I want to do well. Um, and then the last thing is, and this is one of the reasons why I'm not so excited about spiritual gifts test, is because I feel like they're trying to put you in a box. And if you look at creation and humans, there's no boxes in God's creative order. He's just, I, I love what one person said. They said, instead of thinking of the spiritual gifts as, you know, you coming out of the womb and God's like, you're going to be a teacher and you're going to be a prophet and you're going to have the gift of mercy. It says he knit us together in his mother's womb. Kind of think of the spiritual gifts as different colors on a painter's palette. And as every single one of us was created, we were created uniquely by our heavenly father and he designed us. And so there might be an element of teaching in this person, but with the gift of mercy and some compassion in there and a little bit of leadership, but that'll come out later. It's like, so don't try and be like, well, this is my gift and this is what I, don't pigeon yourself, pigeonhole yourself into a spot because that's not how God rolls. He's so creative. And if I know anything just from experience, these gifts look different in everybody. There's different smatterings, different pinches kind of sprinkled throughout in different ways in people's gifts. So just the reason I'm going through these is that we can kind of acknowledge and start to see and step into not to lock you down and say this and this alone from death do you part, okay? Not the point of this, but just to kind of give you an idea. Uh, and then lastly, take notes, and I'm, I'm serious about this, okay, because this is not just for you. Usually you take notes for you, right? Okay, that applies to my relationship, my boss, my marriage. Take notes because I'm going to give you some homework after, don't worry, it's easy homework. It's two words, super simple, okay? I'm going to give you some homework that will actually help you help others, discover their gifts. And if they do the homework too, they will help you discover your gifts. Okay. So take notes on all of them. Even if you're like, I am definitely, I don't have an inch of that. That's okay. Take notes. It's super important. Okay. I need some water. And lastly, um, some of the gifts have words that we use in common language, common business, their, you know, principles and all that stuff, like, you know, hospitality, leadership, they have a meaning. You know what that means. Spiritual gifts have some of those definitions, but some of them are actually totally different. So let me just qualify that, okay? Some of you are like, I, I don't have that gift. It's like, actually, maybe you have the gift, but you wouldn't have what, what the world would call it outside the, you know, this idea. So just to, to put that clarifier. So the first spiritual gift is something called mercy. Okay, mercy. This is the idea of moving towards hurting, needy, weak, marginalized, victimized people in our world 
revealing the compassion of Jesus. That's a spiritual gift. It's a bit, gift of mercy. Some of you are like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Don't all Jesus people, like, aren't we all supposed to be merciful? Didn't Jesus teach about that? Absolutely. The spiritual gift of mercy, though, is something that's just flowing out of you versus something that you're like, I need to work on that. I need to be, you know, I need to, I need to pray about being more merciful because I'm not there. Most of us are in that category. The spiritual gift of mercy, you are on the prowl looking for people who are marginalized, who are victimized, who are weak and needy, and you are just looking for them. You're the type of person you're like, you go to visit someone in the hospital and you come out five hours later having visited and prayed for five other people that you didn't even know before that moment, but you just walk by and you're like, why are they alone? That's the spiritual gift of mercy. Some of you are like, I... I, I just thought that was normal. No, it's not normal. In fact, today, today is all about the gifts that do. So these gifts are the ones that most people don't even think are spiritual gifts, but they are. And when you sit with someone for long periods of time and you use your gift of mercy, someone feels like they've sat in the presence of Jesus. That is incredibly powerful. I had a friend, uh, Dwight, I still, still have a friend, we haven't broken up. Uh, <laughs> He just lives in a different city. We're still homies. We were texting this week. Hey, so, so Dwight's a good friend of mine, and uh, Dwight totally has the gift of mercy. He's the kind of guy that when you're telling your kids, hey, stay away from this neighborhood and don't go down that back alley, he's like taking notes and making travel plans. Like, that's just what he loves to do. He's just like constantly out there. He's like, yeah, what were you doing last night? Oh, I was just out, you know, just kind of walking the back alleys, looking for addicts, looking for people struggling, and sitting down with this one person who's struggling with PTSD, praying from the other side of their door, because even coming in, that would be overwhelming to them, right? Like, just, that's the kind of person person that he is. This one, one time, uh, his wife had her sister over for dinner on a Friday night, and the sister's like, where's Dwight? And wife doesn't even, because this is just part of their life, doesn't even filter or realize what she's saying. She's like, oh, Dwight's downtown looking for prostitutes. <laughs> and the, the sister of the wife is like, what? And she doesn't, still doesn't register. She's like, don't worry, he has a friend with him. And she's like, <laughs> and they're like, oh, no, 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 no. And, and he, this is what he did. He worked with Young Street Mission. And he just, he'd even take his spare time and just go and look for people in some of the darkest, deepest corners who were treated like a commodity, wanting them to experience and encounter the love and the presence and the power of Jesus. If you have the gift of mercy, use it. You often think everybody has this. No, it's not normal. That you engage with people that most of us, we refer to as those people. When we're driving by them, we try not to make eye contact. We turn the radio up at the intersection. We pretend we're having a conversation. Just keep talking. Don't make, it's not normal but it's so good because you don't have a category for those people. They're just people, and that's the way Jesus saw them. And when you use your gift of mercy, you're stretching us because we're seeing what it looks like when Jesus engages the world. The spiritual gift of mercy is powerful, and we just bless you with that. Second spiritual gift is the gift of helps. Um, helps is, is described as assisting others in many practical ways with energy, joy, and revealing the servant heart of Jesus, okay? If you have the spiritual gift of helps or even a little bit of it smattering it, you are constantly saying this, hey, do you need help with that? Hey, can I help you with that? Can I, do, do, you, do you need help? Do you want to just, just call me if you need help, okay? Some of you are like, but we all say that. I'm like, you're right. But when someone calls us on it, it's like, hey, remember when you said you needed help? I got this piano I need to move. It's like, who's this? Why are they calling? You ever had that? Yeah, it's because you don't have the spiritual gift of helps, okay? You should still help them. I'm saying people with the gift of helps, I had a friend, Michael, and he had this, he was part of the church I was at previously, and he would just constantly, like he'd show up early, he'd stay late, anything that needed to be done. I actually had the amazing blessing of being his neighbor as well. And so literally, like, I'd be like, you know, 10 o'clock at night trying to build a deck, and I'm like, hey, bro, do you have a flashlight? All of a sudden, he's just there with his big, like, right? It's just spiritual gift of helps. He'd take vacation time from his company, and then he'd go and help. You know, he's like, hey, I'm flying across the country to Vancouver to help with this charity race. They need someone to paint lines on the street so the bikers who raise money know where to go. That's the spiritual gift of helps. You just can't help but help. It's just what you do. Spiritual gifts of help is an incredible gift. We have people that I know all throughout this church. In fact, a lot of them I probably don't know because the thing about the spiritual gift of helps is you don't care if nobody notices. So often you're just, you just, you just want to help. And that can be a hard thing because sometimes it's like, hey, but... I, I would love it if someone said thank you. I would love it if someone affirmed that. But people with the spiritual gift of helps, they're just like, I don't need recognition. I don't need to be on stage. I am just glad to help. I was talking to anyone else drive in this morning and be like, our parking lot's really flat. If you're watching online, it's like, we have a gravel parking lot, okay? So that, it's not like it's shit. It's, but anyways, so I, I just found Larry. I'm like, Larry, what were you doing yesterday? And how long were you here for? And he's like, oh, about seven hours just driving around the parking lot with his own homemade grading machine that he's just kind of going all the potholes from winter. It's just gift of helps. Didn't tell anyone, didn't broadcast it, didn't put it on his Instagram, but he's just like, there's a need and I am so happy to help. That's the gift, yeah, yeah. 
I love that parking lot. Every Sunday, my kids are grabbing rocks on the way in, like, in case we meet Goliath. (laughs) Spiritual gift of giving. People with the spiritual gift of giving, joyfully and consistently giving away money and possessions. Again, aren't all Jesus people supposed to do this? Yes. But it's a discipline we need to grow versus the people with the spiritual gift of, the, of giving. They're just like looking like, hey, do you need something? Do you, I, I remember this guy I used to know, and he'd just always be like, is your family okay? Do you need anything? Do you need some money? Like literally, do you need some money? Right? Like anything you need, you can have this. You can have mine. Here, I, I'll take the bus. You take my car. Literally, like that's the people with the spiritual gift of giving. There is a lie that says you need to be rich to have the spiritual gift of giving. Let me just acknowledge, I think God supernaturally empowers people to amass great, even stupid amounts of wealth to give it away and be generous, okay? I know people like that. I love people like that. But you can have the spiritual gift of giving and have very little if no money at all. But you just have this desire to everything that comes to you, you don't have that like precious moment. (laughs) I know some of you just got your tax returns. You're like, precious. Your spouse is like, hey, maybe we should give some of that away. He's like, no. You need to pray about that. You need a friend with the spiritual gift of giving to encourage you a little bit. People with the spiritual gift of giving, it's just everything they have, they just want to give it away. They just want to help people. They just want, it's it's an amazing gift. It's radical. And when you use that gift, you're like, I'm just writing a check. It's not spiritual. No, you are showing the radical, radical gifts of Jesus. That he was incredibly generous. And you were modeling that and you were showing that when you use your spiritual gift in that way. The next one, which is tied to giving, is a spiritual gift of hospitality, which is the ability to give away time, money, food, and friendship to reveal the radical grace and inclusion of Jesus. Hospitality is interesting because it's a word that we use a lot in our culture. It's often pigeonholed as the female gift and the Martha Stewart gift, okay? Dirty lie. I know a lot of men with the spiritual gift of hospitality, okay? It's not gendered, and it's not about personality type. You don't even need to cook. I know people with the spiritual gift of hospitality who don't even have a house, but they just love making people feel welcome, making them feel included. They're just continually, continually using that to help other people. Uh, I had this friend of mine, Bert, and uh, he was part of our church, and he's, uh, I think he's almost 70, 70 70-year-old, like typical, like, Dutchman. Like, you shake his hand, it's like, ouch right? He's just like, Rrr. like, he just like, if, if, you know, if it's broken, like a hammer will fix it. It's his only tool, right? And he joined our tech team, which is hilarious. Cause I, I mean, he probably calls his kids to fix his DVD player, right? Like literally like has no, and, and Bert would appreciate me saying that, like has no technical abilities whatsoever. And for four years as a tech crew, we had been hustling five hours every single Sunday, working hard. And it was a miserable team to be on. And in the fifth year, Bert joined the team with no technical ability. So he was just there. He had the gift of helps as well. So he's just like, tell me what to move, whatever it is. And, you know, within the first half hour, once we had emptied the trailer and had all the boxes in the church, he'd just call a timeout. All these these guys are on the tech crew. We never called timeouts, never really chatted because we we didn't have the gift of hospitality. Although he calls a timeout. He brings out coffee and tea, knew everyone's order. He'd just bring that from Tim Hortons. He just drove through the drive through five minutes before we met for setup. And he'd have donuts and he'd kind of set up a little table on the speaker stand. And he'd just make sure everybody stopped working. And we had some time for 15, 20 minutes to connect, hear lame dad jokes. And just, it was amazing. There are people that stayed on that team and served for a long time because of the hospitality gift. Did Bert just pigeonhole himself and say, I have the hospitality gift, I need to be in the kitchen? No, he just said, I'm just happy to serve like those seven men in the book of Acts, and I will just use whatever gift God has given me in that arena. People with the gift of hospitality, here's your secret weapon. Just be around people all the time. You don't even need a home. You live in your parents' basement. Like, it's not really good for entertaining. It's like, just go out, go for apps, grab some Tim Hortons coffee and two bite brownies. Like, whatever it is, leverage your time and your resources to be around people, to help them feel included, to feel involved, to feel part of the community. It's so, so powerful. Leading, leadership is the next one. Directing others with vision, influence, and inspiration towards God's purposes and presence. This is another one that has a word in the business world, which is good. We value that skill set. But there's actually a spiritual gift of leadership, which is a little bit different. Okay, the way I describe spiritual gift of leadership is people who are focused on the what and the why. If you think of mercy as a face-to-face, eyeball-to-eyeball, often one-on-one gift, the spiritual gift of leadership is often on behalf of a community. 
That gift is actually usually for more than one person, for a group of people, whether it's a small group, it's a kid's group, it's a church, it's a movement of churches. That's where the spiritual gift of leadership finds its, its, uh, its sweet spot. You think of Nehemiah in the scriptures. There's all God's people. They have all their talents, all their abilities, all their gifts, but they needed a leader to come in and see that the present reality was more costly than what could be and what should be. And he was going to guide that. He was going to lead that, not just into a good direction, to a that makes sense direction, but to the direction which God is calling them into. That's the spiritual gift of leadership. Often, you know, leadership is seen as something, especially in our culture, which is about power and control. And that's valued in leadership. In fact, there's tons of biographies coming out about amazing CEOs who've done incredible things, raised billions of dollars, and done, done, I'm not arguing, incredible things. And yet you read their biography, and the people close to them are saying they were, they were miserable husbands. They were miserable wives. They were miserable to be around. Because the, the, the talent of leadership and the gift of leadership are different because one of them requires that love be the ultimate part of the equation. That for so long there have been leaders in the church who just point to their leadership gift and excuse them for being rude. No, that's called the spiritual gift of being a jerk, and that needs to stop. There's something incredibly powerful about leaders in the church who leverage the Holy Spirit, and love is always the primary equation in the way that they lead and encourage and then model that for others. That's the spiritual gift of leadership. They have a clear idea where to take people. And then here's the interesting thing. Depending on how your gifting's wired, often... People who have a clear idea where to go have no idea how to get there. And that's why this next gift is actually tied very closely to leadership. And it's the gift of administration. And just go back one for a sec. Administration, I put the Greek word, everyone wants to say this to me. It's actually kubernesis. The Y is a U. So everyone say kubernesis. One more time, kubernesis. That sounds lovely. The reason that's important is because we often, and this is stereotypical and horrible, but often you think of admin and you think of like, make my calendar, get me coffee. Nothing wrong with those activities, but I mean, anyone who's in an admin role knows, first of all, that's not at all what we do. Um, but secondly, the spiritual gift of administration is totally different from that. Administration comes from this Greek word, I'm not even going to try and say it. That's why I put it on the screen for you. Thank you. Thank you. There you go. And it's actually, it's actually the word used for the helmsman on the ship. But there's the captain who says, we need to go that way. We need to fight that battle. We need to do this. Here's the tactic. But the person with the spiritual gift of administration knows how to do and how to get them there. It's the how and it's the when. They are incredibly good at organizing and coordinating individuals and communities towards God's directed, that should be capital for God. Sorry, missed that typo. Uh, someone's going to email me about that. It's okay. Um, you guys write such nice emails. It's all good. Um, God's directed outcomes. People with the gift of administration get things done. If so, what is up with those guys in the back room? You don't even know. There's a back room where they're doing all this. You haven't even seen them, okay? They have the gift of helps. <laughs> they still need a thank you. Go ahead, break on in there and say thanks to those guys. Thanks, guys. Let's give them a big round of applause, eh? People with the spiritual gift of administration find it hard to look at people like me. It's painful. It's like, you, you know where you're going, but you have no idea how to get there, bro. That's the spiritual gift of administration. It's like, hey, let me, let me deal with this. Let me coordinate. You're like, hey, that's tactical. Is that spiritual? It's incredibly spiritual because it is helping Jesus people step into their identity. We are not just gifted people. We are part of a community, which means we are one and we are many. People with the spiritual gift of administration help us all come together. It's like, hey, you're doing that. You're doing that in the parking lot. You're doing that in the community. You're volunteering in that place with those people. It's like, but this is how it's all going to work out. And here's how we're going to get more. And here's how we're going to... That's the spiritual gift of administration. It's incredibly powerful. And it has an incredible impact on the world when it is working right because it helps everybody else work right. Spiritual gift of shepherding. The ability to come alongside individuals and communities and help them see, know, and follow God more closely. People with the gift of shepherding are always, always, always concerned with people. That they have a sense, kind of like shepherds with sheep, have a sense of what is best for them and where to go and what God may be calling them to. And they just desire to journey alongside them. Okay, if you've ever wondered, do I have shepherding as one of my spiritual gifts? Do people want to chat with you all the time? Do they always say things like, we should grab a coffee sometime? Do they always call when they're in crisis or they're trying to make a big decision? Okay, there's a good chance you have the spiritual gift of shepherding. Here's how I know. When I want a good haircut, I don't call a bad barber. 
You get that? When people are calling you and they're looking for direction and they're trying to make sense of everything and they're calling you, that is a sign. You're like, well, I don't know if it, it's like, trust me, there are people they're not calling and there's a reason because they don't have that gift. But you do and it's the reason. It feels so natural to you, but it is incredibly powerful. Think in the scriptures, you think of Barnabas, right? Paul becomes a Jesus person. He used to kill Christians, attack Christians, and all the Christians are like, we don't want to go near him. Barnabas is like, I'll go. I'll go pray for him. I'm in. Then Paul has a disagreement with Mark and doesn't want to hang out with him anymore. Barnabas is like, I'll take Mark. I'll journey with him. I know he's rough around the edges. I know there's some issues there, but I'll journey long. I'll go hard. Like, we will work together. It will be hard, but it will be good. People with the gift of shepherding are people over product. They're the people who are always having the lights turned off on them because they're in the middle of a conversation. They're the last ones to leave. If you have the gift of shepherding, don't worry what you're doing. Just make sure that you're surrounded by people. You can use that gift anywhere as long as there's people around. Last gift we're going to, the last doing gift we're going to cover today is the spiritual gift of apostleship, which is the pioneering, mobilizing, and influencing of communities and movements to expand God's kingdom regionally and globally. Okay, people with the gift of apostleship, they are never happy with the status quo. They always want more for God's people and people in the world who don't know God. They're constantly thinking through, how do we reach more people? How do we raise more funds to get to those countries? How do we do that? Excuse me, that's the spiritual gift of apostleship. They're constantly saying, we should do this. We should try this. Have we ever thought? That's a spiritual gift. But you're just like, I just, I just thought it was annoying and everyone's always bothered by my ideas. But it's like, no, that's actually maybe, maybe, qualify that, a spiritual gift. That you're constantly saying, why don't we start this? Why don't we change this? Have we ever tried this? That's constantly what you're doing. And, and, and people are constantly like looking at you and being like, this is how you know you have the gift of apostleship. Why would we ever do that? That's crazy. We don't do that. We're church people, okay? That's what you're constantly hearing if you have the spiritual gift of apostleship. You have this holy discontent. You're just, you're unhappy with what's happening in the world, and you want more of God's presence to be spread throughout, and you start things. You have an ability to start new things, new programs, new ministries, new churches, um, you know, new mission fields that have never been opened before. That's people with the spiritual gift of apostleship. And the temptation is actually to end up angry, impatient, and frustrated. But never forget, we are again called to love first, which means whenever you start to feel frustrated, whenever you start to feel angry, and why are we still here? And we should have been there 10 years ago. And how can we not get our stuff together? When you start to feel that, there is someone that you can probably grab coffee with and not just be venting yourself. There's someone that you want to chat with, that you want to start praying with, that most people will think you're crazy. I don't know about you, but I love apostles. I'm like, if this is your gift, you're like, that's me. You just described me. We should have coffee. I mean, I think you're crazy too, but I really enjoy crazy. I think it'd be really fun, but there's something powerful about that gift. And when we ignore certain gifts, when we reject some of these, we miss out on becoming all that God has for us. And so I know so often people with that apostle gift, they just feel like everyone's frustrated, everyone's annoyed. You may need to check your, your approach, but also it just may be that it's just, that's your spiritual gift. You just need to keep pressing in and keep praying, keep bringing that, that hardship and frustration to God. So let me land the plane here. We're gonna, two more weeks, we have then gifts of speak next week and gifts that demonstrate the week after, which I'm excited about both of those. But for the next few weeks, as I'm talking about all these things, how do you know and how do you discover your spiritual gifts? And I wanna give you some very, very, very simple homework. Here it is. Say yes and say thank you. Say yes and say thank you. When I was 14 years old, I said yes for the first time. I'd been in church my whole life, but 14 years old, I said yes to serving somewhere. I was the guy who set up the youth room before the youth showed up. I made sure the, DVD, the CD player was working. That's when CDs were a thing. Kids, we'll talk later. We'll show you. It's really cool. You can use them as Frisbees and cup holders now. I made sure the CD player was working, made sure everything was set up. That was just my yes. I didn't know if I had a gift of that. I, I was just like, there's a need. I've been asked. I said yes. In the midst of that, I met one of my best friends that's still a good friend to this day. I got a mentor who's now a best friend to this day. I got to learn that there was actually some other gifting. In fact, it was in that role that someone came to me, my pastor, I told you the story, came and was like, hey, have you ever thought of speaking? And I was like, no. He's like, well, I want you to speak. And so eventually I first said no, then I said yes. And so once I got moving, there was an ability for people to start seeing things. And hey, I think you have this gift and you ever thought about trying this? And hey, you want to run the games? I think there's something about you that people might listen to. And so you just keep saying yes. All of a sudden you start to discover what is going on. And then when people say thank you, you know, maybe there's a gift there. That so often people are like, this is my spiritual gift. And I'm like, are you sure? Are you sure? 
Here's how you know it's a spiritual gift. People thanked you, not for being awesome, but for helping them encounter God with that gift. For me, when I was struggling with the gift of teaching, and I was like, I know preachers, I know teachers, I'm nothing like them. It was when people came and said, I never knew that about God. I never understood that before. And all of a sudden, I just start to explore it because someone said yes, and then someone said thank you. That you just need to say yes. There are many of you that are just like, oh, I just, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I'm ready. I'm not sure I got all my stuff together. And last week we learned, it's like, you don't have to have it all together. You just continue to move. You just continue to say yes to what God puts before you. And so say yes, and then be a community that says thank you when you see someone serving and you experience the presence of God because of them. Because that affirms to them where their gifting is. And so that's really the homework that I want to give to you for, that when you say yes and you start serving somewhere, anywhere, I don't care where, there's something about that that begins to grow you because you grow when you're serving and grow others. You actually enable others to grow when you use your gifts. You're investing in the community of God, investing in other people. And not only that, you're actually making connection. Because here's the thing that people don't realize. People are often like, oh, we need community. We need more community. And I'm like, snore, right? Groan. Not because I don't think community is important, but I think, just think about this for a second. The best community that you've ever had was when you were on mission doing something, even if it was just cheering on the raptors. When you have a common vision, your unity is around something, that's when you meet community and make some of the best friends of your life. It was tree planting out in BC for some of you, right? It's like when you're doing something with people, it's when you meet people and you get connected. Community is often a byproduct of mission. Some of you saying yes is the place where you will finally start to encounter people that you will do life with and be friends with and journey in this spiritual faith for decades and maybe till death. And so here's what we want to do as a community. Over the next few weeks, the next three weeks we're going to be doing this, in the next five weeks, we as a staff got together and we're like, we want to help our community say yes. We want to help them step into and discover their calling in life. And so usually this time of year is the time where we kind of walk around with clipboards. It's like, we got seven vacancies and kids and three vacancies in the parking lot. Can we put your name somewhere, right? And we're just like, forget that this year. Okay, what we decided was we were going to create a living room environment. I don't know if you saw, we moved furniture. Some of you are like, where's my chair, right? We put it all in the middle, put a big say yes booth there. Our staff are going to go out a little bit early so that when you come out to the atrium, some of you got to get your kids and some of you already have plans. But for the next five weeks, we have canceled our lunch plans and we're just ready to stay there as long as it takes to connect with people. Because here's what we realize. There's a few realities going on. Number one, we just love people. Our staff team's awesome, and they love chatting with people. Email's great, texting great, phone's great. We love being eyeball to eyeball with people. And we're like, let's not walk around with clipboards trying to find people a roll and get everything slotted so we can say we're good for the, you know, for the fall. It's like, we actually just want to connect and get to know people, meet your kids, chat with you, hear what you're wrestling with, hear the different things going on, and then promise to follow up and say, hey, we don't even know all the different roles, all the different things going on, but we want to make a relational connection with you and just chat. Because here's the thing I also know. For some of you, saying yes to what has for you, God has for you, for some of you, you actually need to do less. Some of you, you're just like, I, there's a need, I just feel it. I just feel it, I just feel it. It's like, you're not even doing what God has for you because you're just saying yes to everything. And so have a conversation. We'll be like, you shouldn't sign up for anything. You should probably quit two or three of the teams that you're on. There's other you, so you're like, I would never stop by there because I'm already on a team. I don't need to do anything. It's like, no, we want to connect with you too because one, we just love people and we just have this desire that over the next five weeks, we'd connect with every person in the church. It's bold, ambitious, but we're stoked about it, okay? We just want to get to know you a little bit more. But we actually think that God is not static and that he may have you in a role for the next 25 years, but Jesus was constantly calling people to follow him. And for some of you, you're in a role right now, and God's like, I actually have someone else for that role in this next season, and I have something new for you. And so again, we don't want to walk around with clipboards and say, can you fill this role? Can you fill this role? We want to have conversation and dialogue and find out who is part of the body because there's been a lot of transition. A lot of you are new. We don't know you. And so we just thought, hey, it's hard to get to know 700 people in a room, but there's something really cool over five weeks, having a space where you are so welcome to go into that environment. And so we're just there. We just want to chat. We want to follow up. We want to connect. That is so, so, so important uh, for us. I want to invite the band to come up and uh, we're going to celebrate communion in a moment. But here's the last part of the equation. I so, this is my, I told you my secret agenda. It's not so secret, is I want you to say yes to having God move through you. And I don't, I'm, I'm not so passionate about making sure all our roles are filled. I'm so passionate about you serving somewhere so that you can start to see the spirit of God moving through you because that's addictive and that is powerful. And you just continue to say more Lord when you're in that kind of environment where you found this is my identity. This is what my father crafted me and created me for and I'm living it out now. That's the whole point of saying yes. But the second thing I want you to do is I want you to say thank you. 
Can we be a community of people that says thank you? I talked to a youth pastor a few months ago. He said, you know, I got to preach at our, our big church, adult church. He said, I got more thank yous in one Sunday than I've gotten five years of youth ministry. That we are not good at thanking just people that are often not on a stage in church. But can you thank everyone? This is something that's just part of my life. I go to restaurants. I usually try and sneak into the kitchen after and just thank the cooks. There's something incredibly powerful when people use their gifts and their talents. They're made in the image of God. And I want to honor the person who preaches and who leads worship as much as the person who just made my espresso. There is something so powerful when the Jesus people start to say, thank you. Thank you. Because you see the uniqueness of God in each person. And they start to see that God can use them. And so today, before we go out to the atrium, we're going to end by taking communion together. And I want to invite our volunteers who are going to serve to actually come on up right now. If this is new to you, this is just a, a meal that we celebrate. Jesus had this meal with his disciples before he gave his life on the cross. And he took bread and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And he took wine, he poured it out. He said, this is my blood, which is poured out for you. And so we, have, we take bread, we pass it out, and we pass the cup around. And we pause and we remember, we don't worship a God who says, do this and come on and work harder, try harder. You got to earn it. We worship a God who said, yes. I will give my life for you, and our lives are lived in response to him. The reason we say yes is because we're following in our heavenly Father's footsteps. We're going to serve now. God, thank you. Thank you that you love us so much. We need not worry about how valuable we are. We are worth dying for, that you are a good dad, that you would step off your throne, write yourself into human history, and give your life, that your body was broken and your blood poured out so that we may have life and have it to the full and be reunited with our Heavenly Father. We partake in remembrance and celebration. Amen. Would you stand? I want to give you the benediction as you head out. I want to remind you, our prayer teams are going to be up at the front, and so they're ready to pray for anything. And on your way out, uh, you have time of day. I'd love to just see you at the Say Yes booth. And if you, if you have something you want to talk about someone but not Say Yes thing, uh, we'll have other times you can chat. But just want to, in the same way that we leave this space, if you want prayer, really want the Say Yes place to be a place of connection, getting to know, and just discovery and relationship. So as you go... May you live in response to a God who says yes to you, who gave his life on your behalf and shows us how we who were made in his image were meant to live our lives on behalf of others so they can encounter God too. God bless you.